In the historic town of Franklin, Tennessee, stands a home that tells quite a remarkable story. The Greek Revival style structure is the work of German immigrant, master woodworker, and instrument maker, Johann Albert Lotz. Lotz began constructing his home in 1855 as both a dwelling for his family and as an advertisement of his skills. It's notable that the home was completed without the use of slave labor by Lotz alone. Completed in 1858, the home boasted of three fireplaces with three different mantles, detailed carvings of pine cones and acorn finials on the exterior, and a solid black walnut handrail that wraps around a staircase from the ground floor to the second floor. The house is a mixture of styles and ornamentations. The window casings on the front of the house don't even match. That's because Lotz was building a 3D catalog to show his potential clients the many options available to them. But as Lotz's fledgling business took off, civil war was on the horizon. This is the experience of the Lotz family on the day of the Battle of Franklin as told by Civil War historian and Lotz house tour guide, Thomas Cartwright. 1861, the war begins. They were non-combatants, non-slaveholders. Uh, so we come up to November 30th, 64. The, there wasn't going to be an attack at Franklin. And so they stayed. They would have got out if they thought it was going to be a battle. I'm sure they were told, there's nobody going to attack. And uh, it's 3.50 p.m. And what can the family do now? Cannonballs are exploding. The mini balls are whizzing. If they stay there, it's a frame home they could burn up. And by then, you can't get out. There's 26,000 federal soldiers in Franklin. The Confederates get getting attacked. And so what choice to go across the street to the basement of that brick home Carter house? It's 110 paces. I measured it five times. And that's 110 miles if I'm protecting children. Uh, but it's Amelia 17, Paul 9, Matilda 6, Augustus 3, and Mr. and Mrs. Lopes. And uh, they climb that Carter house basement. I'm estimating uh, the attack began at 4 something around 3.50 to 4.15 p, uh, p.m. Um, and, of course, the Confederates came to the center, burst to the center, I'm estimating 4.35 p.m. So I'm guessing about 20 minutes, Confederates came to the center, the brutal counterattack, hand-to-hand fighting all around the house. One child in that basement said she couldn't hear herself speak. The noise was so loud. 11.31, the Federal Army left Nashville, left their dead and wounded, And the next morning, the Lotz family leave the basement of the Carter house and walk into the ninth level of hell time 20. Mr. Lotz's diary said that you couldn't step on the ground without stepping on a dead or wounded man. And these little children, that's the kicker, are tiptoeing through this. And they come into the front yard. Mr. Lotz said, man, we're standing up like scarecrows in the front yard. And then, of course, 75% of the home damage are destroyed. The house still bears the marks of the battle. The wooden plank floor with outlines of bottoms tells the stories of bleeding soldiers positioned with their backs against the wall, awaiting medical attention when the home served as a field hospital after the battle. The walls and floors are still peppered with bullet holes and indentations from cannonballs. The southern wall sustained the most heavy damage during the battle. The chimney was almost all that was left. Once a wall full of windows and light, Loach chose to board up that side of the home since glass was a resource not readily available post-war. But perhaps the most telling mark of the battle and impact it had on this family and their home comes in the form of the most basic of construction materials, nails. In order to repair his home following the battle, this master craftsman was forced to pull nails from the horseshoes of the 17 dead horses in his front yard to repair his beautiful floor. The floor is now a patchwork of detailed craftsmanship completed with the finest materials, juxtaposed with the hasty work done with subpar materials under the most desperate of circumstances. Hammer marks are visible only where the floor had to be rebuilt. The home was no longer a showroom or a catalog. It was a destroyed dwelling, and Lotz's family needed a place to live. We know that the family lived for approximately six months in the cellar 
while Lotz repaired the home above with any materials he could find. In 2010, a two-year archaeological dig began in that cellar. Historian John Marler found over 800 artifacts beneath the home in the virtually untouched cellar. He says it's as if someone had locked the cellar door in 1864. A federal knapsack has been found down there, Civil War shoes, civilian shoes. By the way, Mr. Lutz was the first man in Winslow County to use coal to heat with, and we found his coal bunker down there. Food and textiles, everything. But we found the straw the family's laying on. But the exit of the Lotz family from their Franklin, Tennessee home in 1869 is just as interesting as their arrival. Lotz was also a piano maker. And on one of his pianos, he carved an American eagle with the American flag pointing upward in one claw and the Confederate flag pointing down in the other. The whole country's in grief and mourning. And so now, you know, it's tough in the South. There's no money. Mr. Lotz is having a hard time because his show place home, nobody has any money to do anything. And then, as the story goes about the piano, he had issues with both sides. He didn't discriminate. He wasn't, it wasn't a political thing. Hard an eagle onto a piano, the left Italians clutching the Confederate flag, the right Italians, U.S. flag is over it. Symbolism was real big back then in clothing, in art, in paintings, and I think he symbolized South Law's work. Somebody comes to look at something, sees the piano, left, told friends, friends came back, a war words began. Remember, this is in November of 69. So the war had only been over with four and a half years, the Battle of Franklin five. They had just reinterred the dead. They had a war words. The family says they told the Klux Klan, and they were going to be tarred and feathered. Uh, he was. He was. He doesn't have money. Nobody has any money. He's struggling and in this, so let's go. He sold the home to Buchanan's for $3,800. In our perspective, that's about two hundred and twenty grand for us and left on the eight-month wagon train out to San Jose, California. And by the way, the Buchanans, three months later, they got a knock on their door in the early morning hours, and it was the Klan where his loads. I bought the place, that took the, as the, the family says, they took the piano out and yard and burned it. We imagine the home as an intimate dwelling, the formational and foundational symbol of the family unit. We imagine hearths and dinners and children chasing each other through the halls. We don't imagine cannonball-sized holes in the roof or bloodstains on the floorboards. We don't imagine packing up the promise of yesterday under the mortal threat of the present. And still, this was home for this family. In the years since the Lodes family departed their home, the structure has served as an attorney's office where a local lawyer would offer legal advice in exchange for chickens tied up to her front porch. It's also been a sandwich shop, bakery, flower shop, cooking school, apartment house, gift shop, and a haunted house. In 1974, the Heritage Foundation of Franklin and Williamson County bought the house for $25,000 to save it from demolition. In 1991, the house was up for sale again. When local resident J.T. Thompson learned that there were plans to turn it into a Mexican restaurant, he purchased it with just four hours to spare and turned it into the museum it is today. The Williamson Heritage Foundation says that Thompson has loved the old home in a way that probably no one else since Albert Lodes has. So the house has returned through a conflicted and circuitous route to its original purpose as a show house. The story Lotz told and lived and built has become a text. We might understand its origins and current status best through the lens of theorist and professor Walter J. Ong, who has much to say about how the written word affected human thought and consciousness. Perhaps most notably, the written word changed what was an event. Spoken word, belonging to all, fluid, patterned, disappearing even as it was uttered. Into an object, written word, belonging to the artist, rigid, novel, meant to last. The movement from spoken word to written word has often been associated with death. Ong says, one of the most startling paradoxes inherent in writing is its close association with death. 
This association is suggested in Plato's charge that writing is inhuman, thing-like, and that it destroys memory. In Interfaces of the Word, Ong says, as the distancing is accomplished by literature, the verbal creation comes more and more to be regarded as an object. After all, it is there in the forms of marks on a surface, not only when the author is dead, but even if everybody is. It seems fitting to talk about death since dead bodies were six feet deep at places on the Franklin battlefield. The smells, the smells. They said in Franklin for 20 years after war, they could never forget the memory of the smells. Two years after the Battle of Franklin, people would come to visit and they'd say, my God, how do you bear the smells? That's two years after the battle. So as is the case with most texts, this one reeks of death. And still, Ong says all matters of deep human import, however, are paradoxical. In this case, the paradox lies in the fact that the deadness of the text, its removal from the living human life world, its rigid visual fixity, assures its endurance and its potential for being resurrected into limitless living context by a potentially infinite number of living readers. When the text is handed over, when the home becomes a museum, it is resurrected and reincarnated. It now has the potential for being read and reread again and again and again. So this isn't death as finality. It's death that moves toward new life. As Lotz was crafting the black walnut handrail for the staircase of his home, he was writing. When the tour guides tell the visitors to the museum about the staircase and their hands trace its smooth curves, they are rereading and resurrecting his text. An uh, old home, a historic site, an old home is not just wood and nails and brick and mortar. Everything tells a story, and that's what uh, history is about for me, it's the stories. It's not dates, figures, and facts. What's a date, figure, and a fact? How long can you run with that? How much motivation or how, how can that touch you, a date, figure, and a fact? But when you see Mr. Lope's hand woodworking, whatever home has their story, I think these people live forever as long as they remember. They don't, they don't die. Their legacy lives on. That can be carried down for future generations. Rhetorician Richard Weaver says, whatever the field we gaze upon, we see things maintaining their identity while changing. Things both are and are becoming. They are because the idea or general configuration of them persist. And they are becoming because with the flowing of time, they inevitably slough off old substance and take on new. No one makes love in the beds at the Lotes house anymore, but the home still incites passion and gives birth to curiosity as visitors read its story. No one eats dinner at the roped off table in the formal dining room, but the tour guides still take lunch breaks at the gift shop counter. Potential customers no longer tour Lotz's 3D catalog to decide which of the three mantles they'd like to order for their own home. But school children cross the threshold into a three-dimensional history book, immersing themselves in the text of the Civil War. No one sinks into the refuge of an exquisitely carved armchair after a long day's work anymore. But every night, employees lock up the home with fulfilled exhaustion, having conducted tours which breathe life into the text again and again. The home is a text, resurrected and retold. Ong says that nothing in literature, and we might add architecture, means anything apart from our lived lives and the good and evil in real life. No word or group of words has meaning apart from its insertion into an existential, historical, lived context. Without that kind of meaning, texts fall out of circulation and buildings are torn down. But as we trod in the Lotes home, 
let us not elevate our position beyond what it is. In the deconstructionist vein explored by Sola Morales in From Autonomy to Untimeliness, we should not relativize or make parenthetical the source from which the aesthetic object springs, concerned only with vessels in which are received and appropriated by hermeneutic processes of decoding, eliminating the author in order to give pride of place to the receivers. Walking through a museum that was once a home creates a unique kind of knowledge but Ong reminds us that knowledge is much more than a commodity. Knowledge that comes from immersing ourselves in someone else's creation will always be a shared experience. One in which we trace our fingers with caution or passion or curiosity or respect along the lines of the marks someone else has made. Connecting what is to what is becoming. Uh, history is not just some boring, monotone, dry thing. It, it, it lives. It always lives as long as these people are remembered. As long as they're remembered, they never die. And they'll always be remembered at the site today. Mm-hmm.